European art, which is neoclassicism. Neoclassicism, you know, roughly begins um, in 1780, 1784, and will continue um, in Europe and America up until the year, around the year 1820. So make sure that you uh, hit pause, read the note packet that I have attached to kind of give you some background information. And then once you're done that, come on back to us and then uh, or come on back to the video and we will continue. So neoclassicism really is a rejection of the ordinate and over the top and selfish qualities of the Baroque and Rococo area or eras. And if you think of the name neoclassicism, neo means new, so it's the new classics. And what they're going to be doing is they want to go back to the time of the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. And we'll talk about why. So um, in order to be seen in the late 1800s in Europe as a gentleman and someone who was well-rounded, um, and this even was true in America, you went on something that was called a grand tour. And what that was is... Uh, once you graduated college, you would take a major trip to Italy, um, and you would visit various cities, Rome, Florence, um, and also Pompeii, because Pompeii had just been discovered um, in 1748. And when you went on this trip, it was a sign of your culture and affluence. And as uh, the 1800s go on, they will also extend that trip to visit, uh, to visit Athens and to see the uh, Acropolis as well. So that's kind of, you know, that's the influence behind this era. Um, so not only are these wealthy, educated men seeing the remnants of this classic architecture and classic art, they are also now beginning to also look back to the writings of this period. And they're looking to the ideas of, of self-sacrifice, of giving yourself to the goodness of your people and to the goodness of your country. And that's really going to be what the driving force of neoclassic art is and what it's going to be. So if you were to think of the qualities of neoclassic art, uh, it would be rational, orderly, calm. It's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be highly emotional like we saw in Rococo with its kind of sexuality, and it's not going to be uh, highly emotional like uh, Baroque art. Uh, a lot of the subject matter is going to be history and mythology and trying to connect that history and mythology of sacrifice to the people living in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, the technique is a, a heavy emphasis on the use of line, uh, that the images are uh, highly finished. You're going to have the use of a lot of linear perspective, leading your eye to a uh, carefully pointed part of the painting. And these images, if you were to see them in real life, are also massive. These are massive canvases. Sometimes two stories tall is how, is how large they would be. Um, and the art was meant to be morally uplifting, inspirational, and it's trying to uh, reflect this mood of self-sacrifice for the good of your country. Um, and a lot of what is happening here is also influenced by um, another art historian known as John Wickleman. Uh, he will write the history of ancient art, and that is going to kind of really influence the artists of this period to kind of re-examine uh, the art of the Greeks and the Romans. And we have, again, this renewed interest in the classics. Make sure you write that down. So our first artist that we're going to take a look at is a gentleman known as Jacques-Louis David. He will be kind of the father of neoclassicism. Born in, in Paris, lives the majority of his life in, in Paris. He is a revolutionary when the French Revolution starts in 1789. Uh, he will be a member of the National Convention, which is the radical government that will come about after the revolution starts. And he will actually advocate and will vote to have the king executed. Um, he's a survivor, too, because uh, when the revolution kind of falls apart and Napoleon uh, rises up and becomes the leader and the emperor of France, he will also become the painter of, uh, of Napoleon. So he's a political survivor, and a, uh, he will become a chameleon as well to the, to the situations that are taking place in France. So uh, the first painting that you have to know for Jacques-Louis David is this one. And this one hung in my room, or it hangs in my room currently uh, in the back corner. And if you were to see it in, in, in the Louvre today in Paris, it's huge, all right? It is about 18 feet by 20 feet. It's massive. Um, and it's meant to kind of overwhelm the viewer when seeing it. So what the painting is, it's called the Oath of the Horatii. And the Horatii 
Patriarchi is the ruling family of Rome in this period. So you have the father there who is the leader of Rome, um, and then you have his three sons who are taking this oath that they will fight to the death uh, to defend their city. Because what's about to happen is the two leaders of two city-states, one city-state is Rome, the other one is called Alta Elba, and the, the two leaders say that instead of having our, 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 our armies go to war, let's have our sons go to war. Less people will die, and whoever's sons survive, that will be the leader, uh, or that will be the decider and who wins, uh, whoever wins the battle. So these three sons are, are taking this oath. Their, their hands are held in the Roman salute uh, called the Bellamy salute. Uh, the father's telling them to take the oath of their country. And it's this idea of they are going to sacrifice themselves for the good of their country. Their army's not going off to war. It's just the three of them. And this ruling family is sacrificing. Now you have some people on the other side that are showing emotion. A lot of times in, in neoclassic paintings, men are strong, women are, are emotionally weak. So you have uh, in, the, in the shadowed area the wife of the leader of Rome, the leader of the Horatii. She's comforting her grandchildren. Uh, the two women over here are very upset. One of them is actually uh, the sister of the, of the opposing side, and she's married to one of the Horatii. Uh, the other sister in the orange, she is meant to be married, uh, married off to one of the opposing men of Alta, of Alta Elba that may die. So no matter of what happens here, somebody is going to lose something. Now, what are the neoclassic qualities? Well, the story is neoclassic. This is a Roman story uh, of self-sacrifice, and it is pre predating the French Revolution. It is This is created in 1784. Eventually, you know, in 1789, the revolution will start. But it's this idea of people should sacrifice themselves for the good of their country. That will kind of become a calling card for the revolution in France when it starts in 1789. Uh, we have a highly finished painting here. All right, all of the, you know, all of the lines are all shaded in. Uh, you have shading. You have the dramatic use of kind of light coming down on the center where the swords are and the, the oath being taken. You have the Roman architecture. Um, so that's all the influence here that we see that, that relates it to the, to the, to the Roman period. Make sure here that you stop, take a pause, and write down the, the everything I haven't read. So again, self-sacrifice for the greater good. Created a sensation at the 1785 Salon. And Salons were big in, in French art because it is where artists exhibited their finished works. And it was like a... Uh, an opening day, essentially, where artists would put up their works, and people would come in and critique them, and it would it would influence uh, the artistic style of what was popular at that time, whatever was being exhibited at those salons. He also created the painting, The Death of Socrates. Uh, this is a Greek story where Socrates, he understands that, you know, he, he shouldn't really have been sentenced to death, but he's going to die because it's what the democracy of Athens wanted, and he is teaching his, his, his students there one last lesson as he's about to drink that hemlock. You know, while it may not be the right thing that he is dying for corrupting the youth and he doesn't believe he was really guilty, he will go along with what his government says and what his government believes is correct, and you see all the emotion there in his students while he is the strong one uh, giving that last lesson to his students. Now this painting is not a painting that you have to know, but it is still a neoclassic painting. So this is a painting by Jacques-Louis David you may remember from your freshman year. So this is the death of Marat. So Marat was a, uh, a writer um, for a newspaper in the French Revolution. He was a muckraker. He really tried to stir the pot um, in terms of angering the average French citizen. Um, and he eventually is executed in his bathtub while he is writing for the paper. He had a really bad skin condition that led him to soak in a bath, um, a medicinal bath, for hours at a time. And <coughs> Jacques-Louis David was a good friend of his. He stabbed really right in the neck, and it punctures an artery, and he will bleed out in this tub at his funeral. Um, he becomes, he's, oh, he's canonized almost as a saint. His, the tub that he would soak in is raised up on the altar of the church. Um, and he, he looks here, and he is depicted, though, uh, much like someone else we have seen in art history before. And I wonder if you guys can think who he's meant to look like. He is me he's depicting Jacques-Louis David. Jacques-Louis David uh, is painting Marat 
God who has sacrificed himself for the good of the revolution. That's that, that's that connection to neoclassicism. He is connecting him to Mary. All right. If you look at the way that Jesus' body is portrayed here in the Pietà that Michelangelo created, um, he wanted to portray uh, Mara in the same way. Very dramatic, but all about sacrifice and the lighting that's coming in there over Mara's body. So neoclassic style didn't just stay in France. It actually is adopted by America. And in America, we don't really call it the neoclassic style. We often call it the federal style. And it is kind of the, the, the style of architecture that a lot of early American governmental buildings will use. And it's influenced by Rome, and it's influenced a little bit by Greece, because those are the homes of democracy and republics. And if you think of the founding fathers, Jefferson and Adams, um, and also Ben Franklin, they will spend a lot of time in France uh, during the beginnings of the American Revolution and after the American Revolution ends. So they're influenced by that neoclassic style. So the first artist that we're going to look at is a guy named, is a sculptor named Jean-Antoine Oudin, and he is going to create uh, a sculpture of George Washington. His subjects were usually great men um, who were also his contemporaries that lived during his own lifetime. His work was very popular in the United States. Uh, he will do uh, sculptures of Jefferson, Franklin, and also Washington. Uh, that is, he also does sculptures of famous uh, French contemporaries like Voltaire. Voltaire was a famous philosopher. But the piece that you have to know is the piece that stands today in the uh, rotunda of the Virginia State House. So this is George Washington, and he is portrayed as a Virginian aristocrat and a country gentleman here. And there's some Roman symbolism here. That little bundle of rods that we see him kind of laying his arm on is called a fascist, and that is a symbol of a senator, something a senator would carry with them. And we also have behind him a plow because he was a essentially a, a farmer. And this kind of is connecting Washington to the story of the Roman emperor Cincinnatus, who set aside his country life to serve his country. And that's what they believe Washington was, a modern-day Cincinnatus. So Washington leans um, on the fascist. There's 13 rods there to symbolize the 13 colonies for which he gets his support. And if we look at neoclassic architecture, it is very much influenced by um, ancient Greece and Rome. It's symmetrical. There's order and balance. We have the ideas of porticos, which are those um, extended entranceways that have pediments on them. We often have rotundas, which are domes on top of a drum, which comes from the uh, Pantheon in Rome. And the best uh, known one is Monticello, which is the home of Thomas Jefferson. So it started in 1768. It's finished in 1806. Uh, Monticello means little mountain in Italian. Um, it is the chief building on the Jefferson Plantation. It has a very symmetrical uh, interior design. It has a rotunda at the top. It appears to be one story, but the, uh, the balustrade, or balustrade at the top kind of covers where the second floor would be. Um, and you have the, the portico that comes out that has the um, ionic or the uh, Doric columns above the doorway. We have those pediments there that have a window in them. Um, it's inspired by the Palladian villa in Italy and Roman ruins that existed in France. And Jefferson was really obsessed with saving space in his home. He has, so we have very kind of narrow spiral staircases. Beds are kind of placed in alcoves. He sells beds as like wasted space. And uh, uh, beds that, that were in alcoves or in walls between rooms. It's kind of, it's a very neat place to view if you ever get to go inside. And that is it for, Roman or for neoclassicism. And in our next video, we will be getting into uh, more art of the 1800s in, in Europe and America known as Romanticism. See you then.